Well, we want to welcome you that are tuning in by way of internet, whatever means that you catch us, Roku or website, or I don't know how all that happens. There's people a lot smarter than me know how it happens, but it happens. Amen. But we invite you to, uh, to just participate with us. Get your Bible. If you have one handy and can, I know if you're, you know, I'm super mobile and sometimes you can't get the Bible out, but Anyway, we just uh, we, we have ways of doing this everywhere now, don't we? I mean, people people tell me they're watching in the car. I hope somebody's driving and while they're watching. <laughs> but, but but anyway, hopefully, so. uh, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of things that we can do. But uh, text somebody uh, and tell them to tune in, and then we'll just all enjoy the Lord together. Can let's give our friends a great big praise, God. Can we? <laughs> and, uh, we're glad you're a part tonight. We really are. Amen. Well, you may be seated, and again, it's good to have all of you with us. We believe that God has something super special, super special in store for us tonight. Amen? Praise God. Uh, we're going to, well, greet, one, greet everybody before we get into sure, the I do. Sure, I do have some things I'd like to say here in the beginning. We're glad to have you with us, of course, and if you are watching us from uh, other states or maybe another country, let us know about that. It's always great uh, to see to see our friends and meet new people. We Amen. love to, to hear about that. So be sure and let us know. <laughs> and um, also, I just want to talk just a moment. Here in the church, we're celebrating Love Week. And we have done this for several years now. But uh, in relationship to Valentine's Day, we take that whole week right. And we do kind, loving things for people around us, maybe somebody that's maybe going through a difficult time or just somebody you want to show God's love to. And, uh, you know, love and kindness, compassion, that's what separates the Christians from other people. Amen. It really is. And so find something this week that you can do for someone. The Bible says, be mindful to be a blessing. So do something kind and loving for someone else. And God uh, will be able to just show himself uh, to those people and reveal himself to them through that love that you show. And then also your sweetheart, do something kind for your sweetheart. Are you going to do something kind for me? We're going on the record, aren't we, here right now? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So do something sweet for your sweetheart. <clears throat> Amen. Right? Amen. Okay. Well, that's uh, good counsel, believe me. It, it, it'll do a lot of things for you down through the years. <laughs> believe happy me. wife, happy life. Is that what they say? Well, Amen. you said it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. We're going to get in the Word here in just a minute, but we're, of course, it is our Wednesday evening service, so we always receive a, a Wednesday evening offering. And I want to say how much uh, we are thankful for you and your faithfulness in giving. We, uh, we'd have a hard time doing it without you, believe me. Uh, it couldn't happen without you and God using you. Now, we know our source is the Lord, and so we are quick to acknowledge that, but we're also quick to acknowledge He uses you, He uses people. And so we're very thankful. We have gratitude for your, for your generosity toward the ministry here. We really do. And so uh, we're going to pray over your giving. Nora will give you some how-tos on the giving. Yes. You can give online through text or through the mail if you would like to do that. Amen. Well, we're going to pray over the offering and we're going to pray over the word as we begin. Father, we ask you to bless our time together. We pray for our friends and people here in the room. Father, as they give, we ask you to bless their life and bring it back into their life. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. We believe that because Jesus taught us that. But above any other reason for our giving, we give out of our heart of gratitude and love and thankfulness to you for all that you have done and all you're continuing to do and all that our future holds because, Jesus, you have given us a bright, bright, bright future. And we thank you for it. Now, Father, as we open this precious book and look inside it to hold the wondrous things from your book, we ask you to give us your mind, your wisdom, your insight, and we thank you for that. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in agreement, say a great big amen. amen. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen. Let's say it again. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. You know, in uh, my lifetime, for sure, and uh, that would include you all too. Uh, I might be the oldest one in the room, but I don't know. Close. Um, we've never been in times like this. We've gone through, well, we, I say we've gone through, we're still in this COVID thing. Then we come into the election thing. And you, I remember in uh, the uh, 2000 election, you remember the, the Gore-Bush thing? And we were waiting on the <clears throat> hanging chads in, in Florida and all that stuff. You, anybody can remember mm -hmm. that? Well, we were on our way. There was a group of us, and we were on our way to the Philippines. We were doing a missions conference, and we were on our way over there on election uh, night and waiting for the results and we're moving toward that and then uh, we stopped in Houston. We we're catching a plane in Houston. We we're spending the night down there and so we all gathered in in one room and uh, we we're watching the election returns. And uh, anyway, we did the whole trip, came back, still wasn't done. Okay, so we didn't get to hear it that night. Let's just say that. Well, this has been a lot longer than that, hasn't it? I mean, we've gone through a lot of things in this election, the up and downs and the twists and the turns. Yes. And, uh, of course, there's many people out there declaring that it's completely over and you need to stop. And, uh, you know, people like me who still hold out uh, hope for some other thing to happen, you know, people can call you crazy and they, people can just say, well, you're, you're not, you know, you just need to drop it. Well, I'm not willing to drop it. And, uh, and I'm willing to talk about reasons why I'm not willing to drop it. And there's one thing about us as Christian people. We should adopt the principle of Winston Churchill. Never, 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 never quit. And so when you think it's over, it ain't over. And there's a God in heaven, and as long as God sits on his throne, things are not over till he says they're over. God will always get and have the last word. And I, I have a, now I know that you can't be totally, uh, you can't base your life on, on these things, but you can to a degree. Uh, there's, there's a reliability to it. But we as believers in, in the Lord, when you got born again, somebody moved inside you. The Holy Spirit moved in you. He's not somewhere else. And you don't have to have a prophecy out there and a word over here and something else and a sign and a wonder and everything else. You have the greater one living in you. And the Bible says that that greater one living in you will show you things to come. That's one of the promises related to the Spirit of God. And until I lose the witness of the Spirit, I'll continue to stand. And I haven't lost it yet. You understand what I'm saying? Now, some of you may be, well, you, you may not hold my position on it. But uh, anyway, I, th I think it's important to remind ourselves of some things. Now, in Proverbs 29 and 2, it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Mm. And so the Bible tells us that there's a, there's a conflict between right and wrong, and there's a conflict between good and evil. Now, there are many people, and I, I know that there are people who would disagree with this, but um, I'm the one talking. And my opinion is just as good as yours. Okay. I consider this to be not about an election, not about a Democrat, not about a Republican, not about political parties or nor, not even really politics. I consider this to be a conflict between good and evil, between right and wrong, between black and white, light and darkness, God and Satan in the street. 
and I consider it no less than that. This is God and the devil in conflict. And don't you believe it's anything else? Now, knowing what I know from Scripture, I just don't believe God loses. I'm sorry, I'm just not buying that one. Now, I've seen the devil think he had it, and I've seen the devil huff and puff, and I've seen the giants roar. I've heard the Goliath and David stories. I've heard all those things. But I still don't believe that God loses, and I don't believe he's going to lose this. Now you say, well, how could it be? How could it be? How could it be? Well, we'll wait and see. Because we don't have to know. The Scripture says the kingdom of God is if a man would cast seed into the ground, and he goes to bed, and he gets up, he goes to bed and he gets up. He goes to bed and he gets up. The seed springs and grows up. You know not how. The kingdom of God works on the principle of uns the unseen. You don't have to know how God does it. You don't have to know all the details. You don't have to know the particulars. You don't have to know everything about it. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are high above our ways. He has ways of doing things that we can't do. Now, I believe that we're in a time now where everything that's hidden is being brought out. Now, we've prayed, and I know for decades now, we've prayed for enlightenment. You, you, you get over there in Ephesians 1, the, the prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians 1. He said, Lord, I pray that the eyes of my understanding be enlightened. And so one of the prayers that we pray is for enlightenment. That's light to come. That's revelation to come. That's insight to come. We also have prayed for decades for an awakening. Now, revival is what the church needs. When revival comes, the church is revived. The church from a maybe lukewarm, backslidden, semi position, or maybe more than semi backslidden. But the church revives. That's when Christians get back on fire. They catch that new wave of fire and energy from God. But when you talk about an enlightenment, that's when the blindness of the world begins to shake off. And people who would not seek God and did not seek God would know how to seek God. They begin to awaken. And it's just like in the beginning, uh, you, you know, when you get up in the morning and you turn the light on, you go into the bathroom and you stagger in and you look in the mirror and, you know, the light comes on and here you are. And, you know, you're, you, you know, you're wiping the sleep out of your eyes and you're going through that and you bat your eyes and it hurts a little bit. Well, when an enlightenment comes, that's the way it is. You see a little bit of staggering. You see a little bit of blinking. You see a little bit of, I'm not sure. You see all that because there's, there's, that, there's that thing. When the light comes, darkness is gone. And all the things that darkness brought, they begin to be dispelled. So when we pray for enlightenment, we pray for the hidden things to be revealed. We pray for light to shine in the darkness. The Bible says men loved darkness because their deeds are evil. God is the God of light. He's not the God of darkness. <clears throat> and so when we see darkness in Scripture, it's usually a reference to Satan or his work, something of that nature, or evil in some form. And we see God brings things to the light. Now, God has ways of bringing things to the light. He has ways of exposing things that we wouldn't necessarily understand or know about. And without that enlightenment, without that coming, we can continue to, to just go on about our business. We can begin to go on about our routines and all the things that we do. And all the things that were hidden in the dark stay hidden. They don't get brought out. I heard one fella uh, talking about it was a, a lady talking about how, how dirty her attic was and, and talking about the light. And he said, well, the, the light we turned on in the attic didn't bring the dirt. All the light did was reveal the dirt. And so when you get the light, you get the revelation of the dirt. Now, I don't know if you've seen any dirt lately, but there's been a whole lot where I've been looking. And we have a society that has absolutely lost its way completely. And, and one of Satan's biggest tools is he does, does everything through stealth. He does everything under the table. He does it underneath. He does it in the dark. Because if he can keep it in the dark, he can keep you com from combating it. He can keep the light from coming. See, the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. 
When God brings his light in, then darkness has to go. It has to flee. So there's a lot of things that's been, that have been going on in this nation for many, many years, many decades, maybe longer even than, than some of us are alive. And they've been going on, going on and, and they, they become entrenched. They become entrenched in business. They become entrenched in politics. They become entrenched in the church. They become entrenched ways of thinking, entrenched thought processes and entrenched behaviors. Where when those entrenched behaviors are challenged, we're standing at the mirror trying to blink our eyes because the light's causing us to look at it like it's something, there's something wrong with it. Because see, the light brings an exposure but we have dealt with it so long, we've become accustomed to it and we don't even know it's wrong. We just think it's right and it's not right. And so people can talk in, uh, for a lot of, in a lot of ways, people don't understand it. Now, I guess one of the biggest things in this whole process of, see, I believe and, and, and I wanna be clear, very clear, that I believe the election was a theft. I believe it was a treasonous, treacherous, diabolical evil imposed on humanity, imposed not only on the citizens of this nation, but imposed upon the world that's yes. protected by this nation. Yes. And so this is a diabolical evil at the highest level. This is, this is an attempt to rule the world. When you take down the biggest government, the biggest economy, the biggest military, and you put it under the hands of a nefarious government, when you put it under the hands, well, it was at least seven nations that had an intervention in this election. NATO nations, communist China, Venezuela, France, say Canada probably had something to do with it, even even uh, Great Britain. And we look at it and we think, well, they, they couldn't, have, well, they did have something to do with it. Spain, Italy, Rome. Okay. I'm telling you, this is what happened. And the evidence is out there, but the evidence can't be heard because the cover up is so severe by our politicians and our law enforcement and the courts because they don't want you to know the truth. And if you post the truth, they'll take you off of your social media. If you tell the truth, they'll censor you and they'll take you down. Now that's a cover up for the purpose of keeping the dark in the dark, keeping the hidden in the dark, keeping you from knowing the truth. Now, again, you have child of God, you have the Holy Spirit inside you and you know things that other people don't know. Now, you know, it's uh, in some ways, and I've had to go before God and talk about this to him. I said, Lord, in some ways, I feel like a failure in this. And, and you may ask, well, how do you feel like a failure? Well, I feel like a failure in people that I have influence with. Because if I have influence with you, you ought to know better. And if you don't know better, did I fail you? Or ain't you listening? Which one is it? Because something's not connecting. Now, I can't help what these other spiritual leaders do, and I can't help what they say to their people, but I can help, by golly, what I say to you. And I've told you the truth, and I've laid it right out on top of the table, and I'll prove it to you from Scripture time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. And if you don't hear it, well, I don't know. Did I fail you? Did I not communicate accurately? Or do you just not have ears to hear? Which one is it? Are we plastic Christians? Are we the real thing? Which one are we? Are we pretend Christians? Do our, do our, our, do our desires and our friend relationships and our, you know, like me on this and follow me on that, is that more important to you than your walk with Christ? Hmm. Is the influence of this world more important to you than your relationship with Jesus Christ? Have I failed you or have you failed you? Who's your worst enemy? Is it me or is it you? Which one is it? You need to ask yourself some real sober-minded questions. It's not about race. It's not about gender. It's about right and it's about wrong. It's about good and it's about evil. It's about light and it's about dark. 
And see, don't make it something else. And don't hide behind some other, you know, you can, you can look around the corner and say, that old pastor king, he just doesn't understand us. Well, maybe I do. I understand you more than you think I do. Maybe I understand full well. You just don't want to hear what I'm telling you. That's the truth. So I hope I haven't failed you. I've tried not to. I've tried to be faithful to you. If you don't hear, sometimes I'm astounded. I am absolutely astounded at the people who are blind that ought not be blind. I understand the world. I get it. You can't help them. The world is blind because <laughs> their father, the devil, lives in them. He runs their life. But for a child of God to walk in such darkness and delusion and believe that a political party is more important than your walk with Christ, I don't understand you. I just don't understand you. There's something about how you tick and how you operate and what goes on inside. There's something about you. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I had somebody say to me not too long ago, said, well, I'm leaving for now, but, but you know, I might be back when the time's right. Well, let me tell you something about covenant, okay? Let me tell you how this works. For covenant to work, there's two people involved in that. You may not be able to come back just any old time you want to. You break covenant with the people of God that you're supposed to be in covenant with, and then you want to go out and world it up with everybody and their brother, and then you just walk back in the doors like nothing's happened. To hell you say. You need to go smell the coffee. Because I'm telling you, there's some accountability on the table. And God's calling us to accountability. And he's calling us to give an account for our actions and what we do and what we say and how we act and how we vote. And who that separates us from and unites us with. And it's got a whole lot more to do than with things called just racism, so-called. Or all these things that are thrown out in the front of you to stop your faith in God. You're willing to cash in your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ so you can be friends with that much? I don't understand. I don't understand. You'll have to help me. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to listen. Maybe I failed you. I don't know. But maybe I haven't. Maybe you failed yourself. You have to give an account for it. I've done my best. And hopefully I've told you the truth. Amen. Amen. You know, I just think about the path that we're on right now as a nation and as the world, really. Um, this is the last days that we're in. And things that we're seeing now are what was prophesied in the end times. And so this is not another day. No. This is not just no. another time. Uh, and, oh, we'll get it next time. It's, that's not where we are. And I began to think about and look at all uh, the issues that are, are being pushed right now with this so-called new leadership in place. Mm -hmm. And the abortion, I mean, it, it's just like slaughter. The child, what is this, child sacrifice? Is that where child we are? Child sacrifice to Molech, Molech the God. That's yes, exactly what I believe it is. It is. And yeah. they're talking about if the child is born, you set it aside and just let, let it, it die. die. And nobody can. Yeah, that's the governor of Virginia that said that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And if, uh -huh. if anybody tries to help the uh -huh. child, then they're in trouble. And then you've got this marriage, mm. attack on marriage. How can you do this as a Christian and say that mm. it's okay? Marriage is between a man and a woman. That's right. And so, but they're saying, no, no, no. You, you're just not enlightened. With your kind of enlightenment, I'm sorry, I don't want that. But then the sexual perversion that that's in our society, and if you don't accept it, or if, uh, you know, there, what's wrong with you, if you try to say anything about it, we'll censor you about our children's education, teach them anything and everything, and then we wonder why our society is the way that it is. We need to go back to the basics and go back 
to teaching Christian principles, the Ten Commandments. Can you imagine how evil that would be to put the Ten Commandments up on the wall? I'm telling you, when I went to school, that yeah. we had the Ten we Commandments. Mm -hmm. We prayed. We yeah. read the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. I mean, and, well, and it was Bible, a better time. Had Bible reading every day. Yes, yeah. and it was yeah. a better time, and even sung songs, Christian right. songs. Can, right. can you imagine? I'm, I mean, mm -hmm. kids today couldn't even imagine that, but that's how off course. But if you stand with that side, you are going against the word of God. Right. right. The, it's, it's like we've talked about so much. It's the platforms that matter. And um, excuse me, <clears throat> I'll just say this. Both parties have big issues. Yeah, real big. Big issues. Real big issues. But you have to choose which is the mm -hmm. worst. Who's on the Lord's side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. and then we start praying and then we start doing what we can to see godly people, righteous people, moral right. people right. put in situations to where we're right. not dealing with this wicked abomination before the Lord. And we're right. saying that's okay. It isn't okay. I will never say it's okay. I will never say that. Well, I was born in the 50s. And, uh, you know, 50s was post, you know, we were the baby boomers, post-World War II generation. And it was a good time in America. It was a good time to be young in America. And there was a lot of innocence, you know, at that time. TV's just coming on the scene. We hadn't been corrupted with that yet. Corrupted with all that. And all those things. But I remember going out in the backyard at night and uh, there, there was a time that you could, uh, and it would be as big as in the paper and in the news, and they could tell you, you know, you go out so and so time, and you can see Sputnik flying over. Now, some of you maybe do or don't know, remember what Sputnik was, but it was a, it was a Russian satellite. Now, a satellite, that was big, you know, because it was the space race, and you could go out and you could see it blinking across the sky, and you know, it's way up there like a, like, kind of like a moving star. And that was a big thing to think that we could actually go out and see a satellite crossing our, our skies. And so you'd do all that. And then I remember in, in, I think it's 1959, I believe it was. And again, I was just a boy. But I remember Nikita Khrushchev coming to uh, the United Nations. And I remember this very well as a boy, even uh, because, because it was so big. It was, and as people were talking about it so much, and the space race is on between the United States and Russia. So Russia's, you know, Russia's the bad guy. The United States is the good guy, and that's what was going on. Well, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who led the Soviet Union uh, between 1953 and 1964, and in 1959, I believe it was, he, uh, he said these things at the UN. He said, your children's children will live, and he's talking to you about the U.S., and he, he, one of the reasons it makes it so memorable, and you can go back and, and YouTube it and you can see it, but he had his shoe off and he's beating on the, on the, the, the table in front of him at the UN with, the, with his shoe. That was like his gavel. He's beating on the table with his shoe. He said, your children's children will live under communism. You Americans are so gullible. No, you won't accept communism outright, but we will keep feeding you small doses of socialism until you will finally wake up and find you already have communism. Wow. We will not have to fight you. We will so weaken your economy until you will fall like I've overripe fruit into our hands. The democracy will cease to exist when you take away from those who are willing to work to give to those who would not. Oh my goodness. And that's a socialist state, you don't it, it, really. And that's now, what they're trying to do right now. Well, of course. Now there's eight things that they give right here related to that, that were their strategies to use to cause socialism or communism to take over America. Now remember, this is 59. Okay, so it's had a long time, 60 plus years to run. All right. Be patient. First thing was health care. Control health care and you control the people. Now, that, that was a big thing under Obamacare. People trying to say and people trying to offer the warnings. But, and, uh, well, we obviously got it. And the Supreme Court, the, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, because it was so unconstitutional to do it, the Supreme Court 
chief justice rewrote the law in mm -hmm. the court mm -hmm. to get it passed. Well, wonder why he doesn't rewrite some other things well, to make it right. Well, that's a good question. Isn't it? <laughs> good question. So health care was the first one. Second one, poverty. Increase the poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easier to control and will not fight back if you provide, if you are providing everything for them. Everything. So poverty is a strategy of socialist communists, of which, openly stated, this administration is socialist communists. Mm -hmm. Just telling you what the agenda is. All right. Number three, debt. Increase the debt to an unsustainable level the way you were able to increase taxes and this will produce more poverty. They've already told you what they're going to do with your taxes. Why? Mm -hmm. For control. They want to control you. Number four, gun control. Remove the ability to defend themselves from the government. That way you are able to create a police state. You looked at the videos of DC lately? How many thousands of troops are still on the ground? You ever seen that in your lifetime? No. You ever seen the government bu uh, buildings with, with prison-like fences around them in your lifetime? I don't think so. And it's not to keep those mean old Trump supporters away because there ain't been any there. And they're leaving, being lied on up there right now in this impeachment farce we've got going on. Just so you don't misunderstand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Welfare, take control of every aspect, food, housing, and income of their lives because that will make them fully dependent on the government. Education, take control of what people read and listen to and take control of what children learn in school. Wow. Number seven, religion. Remove the belief in God from the government and schools because the people need to believe in only the government knowing what is best for the people. You say, well, that wouldn't happen. Well, do you notice the Supreme Court just had to rule that the churches over COVID can meet, meet. Did you know they just had to rule on this because these people have been forbidden to meet in church and worship mm -hmm. in many states? So you think that they won't make rules abridging your freedom of religion? You just give them the right excuse. And when you think that the excuse they're using could have potentially been imposed by the people who are making the rules, you say, COVID? Well, somebody had something to do with it. It's a weapons-grade bioweapon loosed on the people of the world. The it's world, the biggest yeah. crime of humanity since the Holocaust. Somebody did it. And who benefited for most in our country. There was an election that was changed by it. Well, they wouldn't do that. Oh, really? <laughs> class warfare. Divide the people into wealthy and poor. Eliminate the middle class. This will cause more discontent, and it will be easier to tax the wealthy with the support of the poor. So here we go. And that pretty much would be a definition with some additions of the platform of the Democratic Party. And that's what we have in power. Now... See, I believe, now again, uh, I, I'm saying this, and I don't apologize for saying it. I believe that this is a classic conflict of good and evil. I don't believe, it, it, I don't think there's anything in between that. I don't believe it's neutral. I don't believe it's about politics. I don't believe it's a Democrat, Republican issue. I believe it's right and wrong, good and evil at its highest source. And I believe that it is an absolute attempt of the diabolical works of darkness to rule the planet. Because if you can rule the war, if you can rule the U.S., you do, you will rule the world. Yeah, that's exactly that's right. That's a fact. And so I consider this to be the spirit of Antichrist, without any exception. I, I, I don't think it's anything else, but it is the spirit of Antichrist at work. Now, the reason, however, that I don't believe it will win. Now, there's many reasons I don't believe 
I don't believe they'll succeed. Now you say, well, they've already succeeded. No. It's what I said. Never, 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 never give up. This is, a, this is a vigilant fight that you will fight till the day you die. The fight for freedom is never a fight that you're going to ever give up. It may take on different forms. It may have different opponents. It may have different expressions. But it is not a fight that you will ever give up. Ever. That's why I say never, 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 never give up. Mm -hmm. Never quit. Never quit. Because your diligence is the only thing that keeps you free. Your unwillingness to relent is the only thing that keeps you free. Now, he who now lets, 2 Thessalonians 2, he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then that wicked, the Antichrist, will be revealed. The he who lets or withholds, that's what the other translations say, he withhold, who withholds will withhold till he be taken out of the way. Now, the withholding power to the Antichrist revelation is the church. That's the withholding power. Well, last time I looked around, we're still here. Okay? Well, since we're here, we've evidently not been taken out of the way. So since we've not been taken out of the way, the Antichrist will not rule. Well, since I see this as the most potentially possible in my lifetime, maybe in the history of the world. This is the most serious threat of the rule of the man of sin that we've ever seen. And I'm not calling Biden the Antichrist. I'm saying it sets the tone for it. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is this. If we were at that level, then you, would, you, you better get your bags packed because you're getting ready to head to heaven because that trump is going to sound if we're at that level. But I don't believe we are. See, I believe that there's an awakening. I believe there's an outpouring coming before that happens. Now, I believe that theologically. I believe that biblically. And there's reasons that I believe it. And you, you find over here in, in Daniel chapter, chapter number 12. And uh, we, we've talked about this briefly, but I want to just, just mention it to you again. But in Daniel 12 and 4, now, now the book of Daniel is kind of like the Old Testament book of Revelation in the New Testament. Revelation in the New, Daniel in the Old, and they kind of are, are parallel uh, books of the Bible. They tell a lot of the same story. You get the insight from one and the other. But one of the things that Daniel said to us and gave us insight for the future he said in, in uh, Daniel 12 and 4, he said, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end shall many run to and fro, and, king, and the kingdom shall be, and, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, you hear that and you say, okay, knowledge is going to be increased. We're going to have these great universities and people are going to, you know, be able to study in the Internet. And, you know, there's all kinds of revelation of knowledge and all that. Well, I believe that. But it actually... Um, means revelation of spiritual truth. That's really what it's more dealing with. It's not dealing with just university knowledge. It's not, not that. And you see this from the Amplified Classic. I want to read it to you. He said, but you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Then many shall run to and fro and search anxiously through the book, through the book. And knowledge of God's purposes as revealed by his prophets shall be increased and become great. Now, if you think about knowledge, what does knowledge do? Knowledge reveals hidden things. You get knowledge of something, you see something that you didn't know, and now you know it. You got knowledge of it. You didn't know it, now you know it. So knowledge brings the hidden to the light. Fair enough? Okay, so knowledge brings the hidden into the light. So you could say it's revelation. Another thing is you could call it enlightenment. Couldn't you? Knowledge is enlightenment. You got light where you didn't have light. You know something you used to not know. So when you didn't know something and now you suddenly know it, you have been 
awakened. So this is a passage of scripture that deals with the great awakening before the coming of the Lord. That's why I'm telling you, they can't stay in power. There is an awakening coming and it's going to pull this little playhouse down. Now I'm going to tell you, folks, Jesus coming up to his time on Calvary what we refer to as Passion Week. He went through the upper room. He went through all those things. He went through the mock trial. I was thinking about it this morning in prayer, and I was thinking mock trial. Then I heard the Lord say, he said, does it sound like something that's going on today? I said, well, it sure does. He said, yeah. He said, they pulled the same thing on me. He said, they pulled a mock trial on me too. He said, but you know, on Friday, they were really laughing and living it up, and they were rejoicing and having a party. He said, but what did they do when Sunday came? So they may be in the party right now, folks, but Sunday's coming. It may be Friday now, but Sunday's coming. And I'm going to tell you something. God hadn't spoken yet, but he's getting ready to. And he's kept his silence on purpose intentionally for yes. a reason. Because if you keep silence, then they get emboldened. And they bring their nefarious acts. They bring their diabolical deeds. They bring it all out into the open where everybody can see it. They testify to it. They rejoice. They high five. They love it. They set it up. They got it going. Nobody can touch them because they own it all. They own the courts. They own it all. They own it all. They own law enforcement. They own it all. You can't do anything about it. And if you say anything about it, we'll get you. I got news for you. Daniel was thrown in a lion's den. But it didn't work. <laughs> Mordecai and Haman, remember that story? Haman built some gallows. Oh, and he's in tall cotton. He's going to do it all. But he hung on his own gallows. So I'm going to tell you something now. You may be high-fiving now. You may think you got it running your way, but let me tell you something. The God of glory hasn't spoken yet, but he's getting ready to. And I'm going to tell you right now, if I were you, I'd repent because you're not going to like what happens. You're not, like, you're not going to like what's coming. I'm on the Lord's side. It'd be real good for you to get on the right side of this issue. And I'm talking to some people in the church. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be real good to get on the right side of this issue. You remember those groups that opposed Moses and they brought charges on him? They were going to do all these things to him and they were going to take over the kingdom. They were going to do everything under the sun. And the earth opened up and it began to devour and swallow. And they went alive into hell. I don't know how that works, but I, want, I don't want any part of it. And you know what God said? He said, don't even get close to them. That's right. Separate yourself. He said, don't you even get close to them because you get close to them when this happens, it'll get you too. You better change your friends if you need to. If you can't walk with God with the group you're running with, then get you another group. You better get on the Lord's side now because you don't have forever to do this. Ah, preacher. Yeah, you blow it off. There'll be a day you, want, you wish to God you hadn't blown it off. And that day may be closer than you think. Matter of fact, you don't even know if you got tonight. Much less the next decade or 10 or 20 years. You don't even know if you got the next 10 minutes. You don't know. But I'll tell you what, God knows. And if you put your life in his hands, he'll protect you. But you've got to put your life in his hands. Those are your decisions. You have to make them. I can't make them for you. If I could, I would but I can't. You have to make them. You have to choose. But you see it again and again and again through Scripture. It just is not going to go on forever, guys. Everything that needs to be revealed is being revealed mm -hmm. so that when the hammer falls, <laughs> the action from God will be thorough and complete with nobody left out. Why? Because this book 
this, this verse in Daniel 12 and 4. It says, this awakening is coming. This is the greatest time of harvest we've ever seen. That great awakening we've been praying for for decades, it's about to hit. And you're looking at the beginning of it right now because we think an awakening is just, you know, well, everybody's just going to suddenly know God and everybody's just going to suddenly, it's just, just going to be suddenly wonderful. Let me tell you, when the awakening comes, you have to have a revelation of the filth. And you're getting it right now. If you can't see it now, if you can't see it now, mm -hmm. if you can't see it now, something is desperately wrong. If you can't see it now, what would it take for you to see it? If you can't see this for what this is, there's a blindness on some people at a level I am absolutely astounded by. And if you can't see it now, I don't know what to say. I really don't. You know, as I look at things, Eddie and I, I hear what government is saying right now. What we need is unity. And then anything <laughs> yeah. but unity yeah. is what's taking place. Probably smack place. you in the face. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, we were just reading what Khrushchev said, and I was a little mm -hmm. child too, I remember that, and it was a very yeah. scary time, really, right. when all that was going on. But he said, communism will divide. So they talk unity, but there's division mm -hmm. on every side and divide the races. You know, it's so wonderful to come in this place right. and we can worship together uh, with every nation, tongue, and tribe, as the Bible <laughs> yeah, says. It's true. And we don't feel divided and we don't feel that we're not unified or that we don't love one another. We do love right. one another. Mm -hmm. And this is God. And the Bible talks about how wonderful it is for the brethren to get to dwell together in mm -hmm. unity and mm -hmm. harmony. And so you can see where God is and you can see where the devil is. Yeah. You know, you can see that clearly. And we must understand that in these last days, the enemy is trying to divide us and keep us separated. And I think how, what a mess that we have in this nation as far as gender goes. I'm a woman, you're a man. Amazing, isn't it? It is. And we, and, and we respect one another. We have different roles from one another that the Bible tells us about. Yeah. And we can dwell together in yeah. unity. And that doesn't mean that there's not, um, there's not, you know, things that need to be talked about and dealt with inside of that. Just the same with, you know, the, the different ethnic groups. We all need to work on sure. understanding one another and loving each other. But God's desire is to bring us together in unity and in harmony, and the enemy wants to divide us. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the remnant, if you will, mm -hmm. and it is getting clear and clear that there is a remnant yeah. of God's people that believe his word, and we're the ones who will stand up and pray in the face of what the enemy says. Right. No, you must accept it. This is just the way it's going to be. No. You don't know my God. You don't know the word of God and I'm going to fight. Well, you say, well, that's right. You know, you fight and you get in trouble. No, I fight the good fight of faith. Right. I fight with the scripture. I fight praying in the Holy Spirit. I fight praising the Lord, not with violence, right. but I get violent in the spirit. And right. that it's time for the church to get violent, spiritually speaking, in your prayer closet, in your time, in the Word of God, and we can see some things change and happen. I believe that. Well, the Bible says we're in a warfare. Yes. Now again, we're not, you know, we're not out here on the streets, you know, carrying banners and placards, and you know, we're not armed militia or anything like that. But it's a fight in the spirit. Yes. You it fight is. in the closet and prayer closet on your knees and other ways, confessing the word. Will you fight? But it is a war. It really is. Now I want to say this: we've preached our time away, talked our time away here. If you've never met Jesus Christ, 
the, the reason many times people are blind is they don't have the discernment of the Holy Spirit in them. And, and the Holy Spirit comes into our life when we receive Christ. That's what happens. And so you, you gain insight when the Holy Spirit comes in. And we get forgiven of our sins. And we get the promise of a heavenly home and eternity with God. And we get the greatest life that you could possibly ever live on this earth. By far, the peace that passes all understanding he wants to give you. But you have to come to Christ. You have to come while you can. And you need to do it now. You can't put this off till tomorrow. You have to make a decision. And you don't, you don't just make a decision for Christ. If you refuse to make a decision for Christ, you are making a decision against him. It's, a, it's that simple. It is a decision either way. But you have to choose Christ. Mm -hmm. He wants you, but you have to want him. So pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I take you today as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. I repent of my sins. And Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I know you meant it or you wouldn't pray it. Um, it just seemed like we've been here five minutes and our time's already gone. There's a, so much more I wanted to say to you. I know I've been direct, but, you know, we don't have a lot of time together and we might be in heaven tomorrow. So, you know, I got to get said now, huh? What about it? But anyway, we're living in perilous times, guys. And it's time to be on the Lord's side. It really, really is. And I love you. I mean, I'm no, I'm, I know I'm direct. I know that. But I love you. And because I love you, uh, I want you to know the truth. I care about you. I really genuinely care about you. I care what happens to you. Amen. So thank you for being our friends. <laughs> thank you for being a part tonight. We thank you. We know you didn't have to tune in. We, we know you could have done something else, but we're glad that you're a part. Let's bless uh, our friends before we go, can we? Father, we want to thank you for our precious brothers and sisters right now. And we ask you to bless their life. Bless their going and coming. Bless their twos and fros. Bless their ups and downs, highs and lows. Bless their families. Bless their careers. And we pray these things and we believe you to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next time.